Hello, you're listening to a sermon from Community Church in Prague, Oklahoma. At Community Church, we are all about loving God as a community and loving people in our community. If you live in the area, we would love for you to join us on a Sunday morning for coffee and fellowship at 930 or for service at 10 a.m. And now here is our guest preacher, Eric Schultz, with part one of our new Context series. Thank you, Brother Wopsle. I I appreciate him. I love him so much. We are so blessed to have him uh, as our pastor to answer the calling on his life. Yeah, I uh, I report tomorrow to Strother to start my 29th year teaching, and I remember my first year, I. Uh, I spent every night just trying to stay a day ahead of the kids, studying every night. So that's, that's what I've done preaching. I, I'm not a preacher, and uh, oh my goodness, I spend time stressing and fretting over this. Um, Romans 8, 28, uh, hopefully I encourage you with some truths from God's Word, uh, just some stories about my life, how it's come to be uh, evident in my life, how God's patient with me and with us. Um, yeah, I've got to say, everybody has a has a Olympics remark, and mine is handball. Have you watched handball? Have you seen that? I have no idea the rules of that game, but all the years I've coached, there needs to be handball teams at those schools. There are kids that can't dribble, that dribble when they want, that want to pick up and run with the ball. Uh, I would lose my mind in that sport. There's fouls that I don't see. Um, so it's been fun. If you'll join me, uh, let's pray uh, before we get started here. Lord, I thank you so much for the opportunity to answer your call. I thank you for reminding us in your word that you hold us up with your strong right hand and you hold us by our right hand. I thank you for reminding us that you use our talents and our strengths for you, for good, and I just pray that uh, uh, you would use mine today, that I would be clear in sharing your truths. In Jesus' name, amen. Here on the screen is a map of Europe, and you'll notice it's 1815. Um, In 1815 is when the Protestant Reformation started. You know, uh, in Germany is where Martin Luther had his influence. Ulrich Zwingli was in Switzerland. And in the Netherlands was Menno Simons. Now, that's important to me because I am a product of the Anabaptist uh, Reformation. The term Anabaptist means rebaptizer. Um, in German, it's a Taufer, T-A-U-F-E-R. The Taufers, the Germans were Taufers. And if you follow my family history, the names of Hebert, Wedel, Schmidt, Buller, Funk, they start to show up in the Netherlands in the 1590s, just a few years after the Reformation started. And if you, if you know a little bit about church history, in the Netherlands, in Holland, that's where they had the dunking poles. They'd have a long pole with seed on it, and they took people that wanted to re-baptize, and, oh, you want to be baptized? They put in the chair, and they dunk them in the river. Yeah, you like that? You want to be baptized again? And they... They would do that until they died or until they got tired of dunking them. So my people, the German Mennonites, they immigrated and they slowly made their way north to Prussia. And in the 1700s, names added to that were uh, the Bazes and the Schmitz. And they stayed here. They stayed here in Prussia in the Vistula Delta right here which is modern-day Poland. And in this region, Kendra's people start showing up, like the Regiers, the Tysons, the Weebies, uh, the Unraus, and 
they stayed there. And in the 1800s is when my namesake, the Schultzes, the Jantz, the Schmitz, the Tesmers, and the Vos, these are all names in my genealogy. I know that because I've got, I, I think German Mennonites are second only to uh, the Mormons in following genealogy. I've got family books that show, and online I've on, I'm on the Grandma Project that shows uh, my genealogy. So in 1826, in Russia, Catherine the Great came to power, and they fought the, the, the Turks, the Ottoman Empire, and they, take, they took possession of Ukraine, where the war's going on right now. Right here is the Sea of Azov, and Catherine the Great knew that the German Mennonites were good farmers, and they recruited my family and Kendra's family from the Vistula Delta, and they told them, come down here, you can have the land, you can have your own language, you can worship the way you want, and you don't have to serve in the military. German Mennonites were known as pacifists. They didn't believe in killing. They didn't serve in the military. Okay? So, in, uh, so those people um, settled the Maleshna colony down here. And this is where my mother's people's names start to show up. The Heberts, the Funks, um, the Pankratzes, the Janses, the Jansons. And they stayed here. And if you know anything about German Mennonites, they're a closed society because they wanted to live a pietistic life. They wanted to be separate from the world, and they took the Bible translation literally. And so here they started, you know, they didn't intermarry. They didn't intermingle with the people, that the, the, the Bulgars, the Russians. And so they started to go back and forth, and in my genealogy, People are moving all over the place. Volhynia is where the Schultzes were. So in 1874, Alexander II came to power in Russia, and he said, you German Mennonites are going to serve in the military. He was going to revoke the military exemption. You can't have schools in German anymore, and we're going to tax you, and your money is going to go to the local Catholic church. So... Those people said, we can't do that. We know of a place called America. So in 1874, the Schultzes, the Pankrach, the Schmitz, the Bases, they emigrated from Volhynia, right here. They left from Hamburg, and they came to America in 1874 and landed in Kansas. Cornelius Schultz, my great-grandfather, was eight years old. Kendra's people were a little slower. Kendra's people, when they got here to Danzig on the Vistula Delta, they were more stable. They stayed there. They were a little more wealthier than my people, and it took them a longer time to answer God's call to leave, <laughs> which explains a lot about both of us, if you get to know us. Her people came in 1878, Six. 1876, okay? Now, I tell you all that because... I'm a product of uh, Romans 8.28. Romans 8.28 says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. And it goes on to talk about predestination and foreknowing. All of those things that the struggles those people went through, they sold their stuff pennies on the dollar to leave. The Russians, the Bulgars, they took advantage of those people. And when they came here, they struggled. The Schultzes didn't make it very good in Kansas. And I listened to all those stories as a boy at Grandma and Grandpa's house, listening to how Cornelius at eight years old, they hid in the woods before they got on the boat to come over here. And it fascinated me. And I liked the fact that I was different than most people. They didn't have a history like mine. And I was sad that it was going to be over. 
because I didn't live with any Mennonites. My dad moved us from Ringwood, Oklahoma, where I lived with second cousins, fifth cousins, just like those people. You know, in my genealogy, there are second cousins that got married, and there were first cousins that got married in the history. So we didn't go to Arkansas, we went to Kansas. So, um, so I was, as a boy, as a junior high boy, I was sad that I wasn't going to continue that German Mennonite heritage with finding a girl like that. Which brings me, which brings me to, um, how does this, how does that verse apply in my life? You know, the, the Greek word for all in that verse means all, everything, everything in our life. God means for good. And today I want to, I want to talk about the good things that happens to us and the bad things that happens to us. And, and I can't make sense of everyone's problems. I can't do it. I understand why Wopsle wanted me to speak on this. I would have rather spoke on circumcision. That would have been a lot easier. That only deals with half of you, you know. Um, but the crux in my life, the struggle in my life, uh, happened in 1981 in September, 43 years ago. And some of you kind of lived through that with me uh, when my dad died. And I can stand here and tell you that it was a good thing. God, had, God has used that to my benefit. And it doesn't make sense. But there's two, there's two things that, from my experience, it was a good thing. First of all, the reason he had to die was that I put my relationship with my dad it superseded my relationship with God, with Jesus Christ. You know, he, he those of you that know him, I, I, he had a big personality. He was a man after God's own heart. I see him as David. Uh, you know, he was a state champion in basketball. Uh, he, my dad could do anything in my eyes, just like some of your father's. We were cutting wood one day, and he grabbed a piece of wood like this and took that chainsaw to cut that V, and that chainsaw bounced up and hit his finger, and his finger, he did, and it was just laying over. And I was in eighth grade when I saw this. The finger was just laying over sideways, and my dad picked that up and sat it right on there like it was going to stay, and it fell off. And he did it again. He picked that finger up and just put it right there, and it fell off. I mean, how, how do you view your dad when he does something like that? Secondly, the reason he had, to, he had to die and leave was I would have never met Kendra. I would have never, as a little boy, man, I wish, God, I'm, that's, I'm not going to, I'm the fifth generation German Mennonite born in America. I'm not going to. He, he answered a little boy's prayer to let that happen, those struggles to come through. And I've shared the story with you before that um, when I had Evan, he was two years old, we were in Alva, and we were playing in the sand pile, and I just had a moment where I understood how my dad thought of me and how I loved Evan. Oh, that's how dad loved me. And at that moment, I heard God's voice, boom, inside me and without me. I've shared this with you before. That, and God said, but I love you more. Now, some, people, some friends of my, mine will, will disagree with me and tell me that that's not God's will that that, that happened to your dad. That, that wasn't God's will. And I'm telling you, it, it was in my experience. And in verse, in a... Psalm 139.16, God tells us that your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them 
came to be. My dad, you know, we can't sit around, oh, your dad, look at all the grandkids. And no, his days were numbered. That was where it ended. And Job says in 14.5.7, it says that, that our days are, are even specifically into months. We are given so many months to live and we cannot go beyond it. We can't play that game that uh, that's not, no. God knew when my dad was going to die. He knows when you're going to die. He knows the struggles you're going to have. My mom, when that uh, Saturday morning in Oklahoma City, I was laying in the back of the waiting room, and I was sleeping, and I woke up. I think God nudged me to hear the doctor tell my mom, I'm sorry, Mrs. Schultz. I did everything I could. I couldn't save your husband. And my mom said, you're kidding. And he he said something else. And my mom quoted Romans 8.28 to the doctor. And she never wavered from that. I wavered. I wavered for seven years. And if I could go back, I, I, would, I would tell that 17-year-old boy to trust God's plan. But I did some horrible things, uh, criminal things. Um, now, this here's a letter from a nurse that she sent my mom. It said that just before... He was put to sleep. Your husband asked everyone to be quiet so that he might pray. And this is what he said. And he never said anything that night from Friday night till the surgery. He was in so much pain he couldn't, he couldn't talk. He said, um, thanks. he thanked Jesus. He thanked God for having a Savior and that he put his life in God's hands. He said he had the impression that that Mr. Schultz felt that he would not make it through the surgery, but that spiritually he was prepared and accepting of whatever happened. I hope this has some help to you. Patricia Anderson, she was in that operating room at that time. Was just added, and my brother-in-law, Gene, he told me, at the funeral, Gene should have been an engineer. He was very black and white, not much personality. I loved him. He's in heaven now. But he told me, you should take some comfort, Eric, in that Jesus let your dad suffer so he could identify with him. What 17-year-old wants to hear that? I didn't, I didn't want to hear that, but it's true. It, I, at 60 years old, I get it. it it's true. In Psalm, Psalm 139.16, oh, I already, I've already said that, okay. Um, Ecclesiastes 5.19. Moreover, when God gives someone well, an ability to, to accept their law, yeah. Moreover, when God gives someone wealth and possessions and the ability to enjoy them, to accept their lot, and be happy in their toil. This is a gift from God. I want to focus on to accept their lot in life. Some some versions say that we should accept our work and our lot in life. I have a friend, Kendra and I have a friend whose daughter-in-law has lost nine pregnancies nine pregnancies. Some of you have gone things that I can't explain. And the things that I'm talking about, you could be sitting, well, that's nothing. I, I did this. This God let this happen to me. You have rebellious teenagers. You lose people you, you love. Someone is horribly maimed. Someone is horribly mistreated. 
How do you make sense of that? Job tells us, Job tells us in 2.10, he replied, and this is after God allowed Satan to have his way with Job, but you can't kill him. Job is covered in boils, and it says that he sat in an ash heap scraping the boils. And his wife says, why don't you just curse God and die? Just get it over with. And Job says, you are talking like a foolish woman. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble also? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. Brian talked about being in America and enjoying everything we have. Some of us had ancestors that went through struggles we can't even imagine. And we get to sit here enjoying and laughing in church and having the ability to do this and accepting good and, we, and we're not going to have trouble. Job go, goes on to say in 13, 15, though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. I'm 60 years old. In 30 years, I'll be 90. And the way the world is turning, the way we're seeing the world, the way it, it didn't used to be that way when I was a kid. In 30 years, what? could we face? We've had it so good. What if what, what we think is bad in our eyes is God's way of knocking off edges and making us identify with Him? He justified us on the cross. When He died, he made it possible for us to be justified. But during our time on earth, I believe sanctifi sanctification is going on. It won't be completed till we get to heaven. But he's got our best intentions on him. He is. We just sang those songs. We sang them. I don't know if you think about them. Maybe I do because I'm giving this sermon. He's a good father. He wants the best for us. Um, when, uh, when, you, when, you, when I read Job 13, 15, though he slay me, yet I will hope in him, the next part of that verse says, I'll argue my way before him. If... It's okay to be angry. God's not, in, God's not intimidated by the things he puts you through and you get upset. I have been out in a field before and just yelled at God. I was pissed, if I can say that. <laughs> Ephesians 2.10. Okay, quickly. Ephesians 2.10. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us. Before, just like our days are numbered in his book before we are born, we were created for good works, and he's preparing us in advance to do it. Um, his handiwork is, we are his poem. We are his poem. You know, if you listen to songwriters or po poets, poets, when they write something and they let it go, they talk about it, it's their children, and it means something more to different people. That's what we are. We can reach people, different people, with our struggles that you can't and I can't. Um, I just finished painting one of the iconic homes in Prague yesterday. Uh, the... the uh, Merlin and Cheryl Short home. I paint, it's the second time I painted it. Not because I'm a bad painter. It's because paint fails. 
Have you ever painted your house? Why? It's going to fail. Paint fails. But we fail too, and God knows that. And He, he knows in Psalm 103, 13 and 14, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear Him. For He knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. And you know, He's not going to give you more than you can handle. We can. The only way to get through something is to go through it. But we have to trust the Lord to get us through. Um, I know I'm running over. I collect Lionel trains. I don't know why. And I've thought about it. You're 60 year old and you're collecting Lionel trains. There's three reasons. Grandkids, Carrie Moss, and it's a way God has shown me His grace and how He works through our fails, our failures. He even uses things that we fail at to improve us and make everything work together for our good. This little car here uh, is is the uh, the milk car. It's one of the most famous and There's a little man in here that when you push a button, it spits out seven little milk cars, uh, milk cans. But it only it only lets it out on one side. Now I can't explain how this works. I just collect them. But this is a switch, and I can control. If you see that move, the train can either go straight or it can turn. That's not a problem. The problem is when it comes from one of these directions. If the train is going like this and it comes from this direction, it would derail. But this is designed to not derail. And I don't know how it ha- I don't know how it works. When the train comes this way, it automatically switches so it doesn't derail. If the train comes from this direction, when it hits here, it'll switch to right there so I can go straight. It won't derail. So I can, I have a layout, I have three layouts, and I have all these switches out here, and I can set them in one direction, and I can let that train go randomly, and it'll come through, it'll switch, it'll go back through, and it will go until this car is in the right position to unload those cans like it's supposed to. That's how I see God using our failures. If we come to a test, we fail, and we go through, God's patient enough to let us come through and get pointed in the right direction so He can use us. He uses our failures for His good. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank You so much for Your patience. I thank You for the gifts that You've given us. I just pray that as we go into the week that these people who love you, who fear you, the people you have called, the people you have predestined in this room to understand that we have to accept the difficult things in life and lean on you because we know that you have our, our good at heart and you're not, you're not trying to derail us. You are justifying us. You are sanctifying us for your name's sake and your good. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.